I grew up evangelical and I just remember that the kind of sexual rules were so important. I mean, something that seemed to be talked about as much or more uh, than anything else and in ways that were always puzzling to me. And as an adult, as you say, I, I went and got my PhD and got interested in gender and religion, but it always just seemed to me that evangelicalism in particular, but also Catholicism and also some branches of liberal Protestantism just couldn't stop talking about sex and sexuality. Um, and they those issues just didn't seem to me to be core doctrinal issues. I didn't see them a lot in the Bible, which I read a lot as a child. Um, so I think this question has been living inside of me for much of my life. And um, finally, I just, it, it sort of surfaced that I'd never really answered that question. So yeah. I dug deep um, to, to write that. And I, you know, I think it's a, there are complicated answers to that. Um, there's a politics to it. There are genuine fears, I think, that drive people's anxieties and angst about their own sexuality and the sexual behaviors of other people. So it's, um, you know, it's really complicated, but it, it obviously touches something very, very deep in people. And we just keep sort of arguing over these issues yeah. religiously and politically over and over again. And, and why Christians? I mean, you're a, you're a religious scholar as well. So um, is it because America, is it because um, Christianity has uh, dominated the West, whether it was uh, arriving on the Mayflower with American Puritans, and then the, I think the Catholics arrived in Baltimore, I, I think, mm -hmm. at some point? And um, is it because America's leanings do other do other religions uh, have Mormons uh, dealt with this? Have uh, we have a lot of Muslim immigration uh, now? Are why why sex and Christians? <laughs> yeah, well, everything you've said is is true about the U.S. focus and Puritans and all of that. But I think it goes back a lot further than that. You know, to Paul, frankly. I mean, I think we can mm -hmm. go back to and and maybe beyond that, we can see sexual worries in the Hebrew Bible too. But I, I would say the clearest answer would be to go back to Paul and some of the early church fathers and the fear of the body overtaking the soul in some way and the need to be pure and the, the sort of rise of this notion of celibacy as being the purest way that one can live in the world. Um, I really do think we can trace an awful lot back to that. And in college, I actually studied medieval Christianity quite a bit. And, you know, there are certainly sexual obsessions, not only in the early church, but throughout um, the medieval era, um, well into the modern era. So I, I think it goes much deeper than something specifically American. But having said that, there is something specifically American, it seems to me, because Christian Europe, you know, there's, there's, I don't see the same obsession with sex in uh, European countries and haven't seen that mm. for a very, very long time. So I do think there has been something, I don't want to say unique, but something distinctive in the U.S. that, that probably stems from our Puritan heritage and some of the specific Christian influences that shaped uh, this country in its early, in its early years. Was it, I mean, certainly the, um, that's curious to me, uh, you know, because obviously Calvinism, uh, which the, I think the Puritans, you know, were mostly Calvinists, mm -hmm. um, and yet Calvinism is European. So um, was it something specifically about... Uh, the Massachusetts Puritans that I remember taking a class on uh, colonial, specifically American colonial religion in grad school myself. And mm -hmm. I thought, wow, some of the issues we're seeing at the end of the 20th century and 21st century are uniquely tethered all the way back to the Puritans of Massachusetts. Oh, yes. No. 
Oh, why, so why not Europe? Did Europe ever see it? You, do you have a thesis, an argument as to why it's uniquely American? <laughs> well, and I, again, I shouldn't say it's uniquely American. I think Europe at the time of, you know, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, certainly medieval Europe before that, you did have an obsession with sex. What I'm really hmm. meaning is that I think today we don't see it in the same way. Um, yeah. It has something to do with the history of church-state separation in the United States, the disestablishment of religion early, early on that meant that, you know, religion just flourished in a different way apart from the government um, in the United States and in Europe where, you know, there still exist state churches um, there was a lot of rebellion against that and a lot of indifference to that. And, you know, I think it's just we've been shaped differently in the U.S. and sure. in, and that that's made a big difference in how we think about sex and sexuality. Religion and sex sort of relationship is very deep and very old. It's changed over time in the U.S., but it has certainly been part of our history, I think, all along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I'm going to guess uh, you and I are pretty close to the same age. I might be a little older than you. And you talked a little bit about your, I, I think I heard somewhere, you, you were raised Southern Baptist? Yes, that's right. Yes. So were you the, were, were you the uh, Southern Baptist kid in the youth group? And were you still, um, were you still, before the time that American evangelical modernized and they were giving sex talks in the youth group, or was that emphasized in, in your upbringing as far as what we thought of evangelical sex ethic and purity? Yeah. So, uh, so I grew up in the 1970s and 80s in Chattanooga, Tennessee, First Baptist Church there. And you know, I, I tell people, uh, you know, my, my childhood was sort of just before the rise of the religious right, or that was sort of happening at the edges and I didn't know about it. I didn't really feel it directly. Jerry Falwell was certainly already moving, but by the time 1979 comes, which I think is the year the moral majority was formed, I was 12. So I had sort of been shaped earlier on. And my mother, my parents were pillars of our church. My mother was the pastor's secretary for years and years. So we were one of the core families that were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, went to church camp, went to music camp every summer. You know, it was, it has deeply shaped who I am. Um, yeah. And in those years, Josh McDowell, uh, whose name you might recall, was an early, oh, yeah. um, he, he used to travel the country and talk to youth groups, and he wrote books about sexual purity, sort of before, yes, yes, exactly, before what we think of now as the purity movement, he was sort of one of yeah. those early figures, and For I sure. remember him coming to my church, I remember hearing him speak. So it was definitely emphasized. Um, it wasn't preached from the pulpit. And I never heard anyone talk about same sex, anything, homosexuality, either pro or anti. Um, my church was more a, like, I like to say, you know, the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter sort of Southern Baptist. Um, yeah, you know, right. it, we weren't so much the Jerry Falwell. We certainly weren't the Paige Patterson, Paul Pressler, um, uh, you know, which has come to define the Southern Baptist Convention, of course, but still, you know, sex and sexual ethics and morals and no sex before marriage was a very, very strong theme um, in my church life. So it's, it sounds like your church, uh, your Southern Baptist church, and I realize uh, listeners or watchers who aren't Southern Baptists may not know the, you know, the Southern Baptist takeover with Al Mohler and Paige Patterson. And so did your church, uh, I'm just curious for my own uh, interest, did your church go the way of the, the, the neo-Calvinists or did they, or did they stay, were they one of the rebel Baptist churches that didn't go with that takeover? They tried to tread a middle ground. Um, they, for many years, they stayed duly aligned with the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention, and the more moderate, you know, liberal, not really very liberal, but more liberal um, Cooperative yeah. Baptist Fellowship. Yeah. I think some of that was because some of the money in the church came from elderly people who felt deeply attached to the Southern Baptist Convention and weren't really mm -hmm. aware or of the, of the political changes taking place there. 
Eventually, though, the church broke completely away from the SBC and, and, and is still uh, a, a CBF church. Wow. Wow. And I know. <laughs> Easy.